uh, yeah, thanks for everybody online who's here and then everybody who's here in the room. Um, this is our sixth or seventh of these classes. And uh, this is one that is high value because uh, commercial maintenance uh, agreements, PM, preventive maintenance, are really a part of our business. Getting commercial maintenance right uh, is an enormous part of having a successful business at Kalos. Uh, and it's an area of our business that we want to continue to grow. Welcome to everybody out there. I hope my guys are watching this. Um, well, most of them didn't show up, so, <laughs> so we're taking <laughs> names. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so yeah, the commercial PMs, uh, to begin with, the PM actually doesn't, it starts before you even get to the, to the store. Um, what I like to use to do, or what I used to like to do, is review the call, uh, make sure you know the details of the contract, you know, step two, when we actually get to the store, and, and, and we say this a lot, but as you get on these properties, you want to kind of use all your senses. Uh, walking through the properties, what I used to do is take it floor by floor. Uh, so I would go inside and I would lower all the thermostats. But in the meantime, as you're doing that, you know, start looking for things that are out of the ordinary or things that could be potential problems. Uh, communication wires, you know, go up to the unit, uh, test the float switch. Is that working? Um, you look for ice on the suction line. Um, look for really dirty filters or, you know, um, you know, bro broken thermostat covers and things like that. And notes, detailed notes on all this stuff. Um, we're not going to make the repairs at this point, but we are going to make notes of what we're finding. Uh, so yeah, that's the process. You want to go in, you want to take it floor by floor, you want to lower the thermostats, um, you test your float switches, and at that point you're going to head outside and find a condenser. Uh, same thing, you're, you're being alert of what you're seeing, you're looking for torn insulation. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, you're looking for ice. Um, you know the five units, six units, whatever it is that you turned on, the first thing you're going to want to do is make sure those units are all running and the compressors are running. So yeah, normally we split up the guys at this point. You know, one guy goes outside, the other guy stays inside. Uh, we want to do the visual walkthrough on the condensers too. You know, look for beat up uh, low voltage wiring. You know, listen for those really loud compressors. Just anything, anything that looks crazy, you know, watch out for that. And I, and I want to just mention quickly that um, maintenance, like any service call, you want to keep your eyes open for everything. And anything that either aesthetically doesn't look right that the customer could point out, and this can be things like dirty return drills. Like you may look at a you may look at a scope and say, "Well, that's not part of my scope. I don't care." If it looks bad and the clients can see it, that's something that you should address. Um, and sometimes addressing it means that it's well out of scope and they're going to have to pay for it. And sometimes it means that it's something that's easy enough just to take care of. So something like a dirty return drill, you got a couple of them, just take care of it. If you're coming into a new contract and you're going to have to pull all of our turn grills out and wash them outside, that's probably something you would want to add in. And so using your using your senses to assess all of that. But I like what you mentioned in terms of freezing and moisture. Those are two of the big things that you need to pay really close attention to. Not only active freezing or active moisture leaks, but signs that it's been occurring uh, is really important to pay attention to. Go ahead. You had a question? Yeah. So where would you draw the line is what is a normal PM? So when we, when, when, we, when we create the contract, especially if, if it's our first visit there and you see something like Brian mentioned where they've got 17 return grills and they're all filthy and you know that's going to be a, uh, be a job getting those clean, we'll price that into the, into the initial contract and we'll word it like for this year, this is gonna be your price and it includes an extra $500 because we, we gotta spend half a day pulling return, returns from the ceiling and cleaning them up the key is once you do it once, if you do it correctly, you don't have to spend anywhere near the same amount of time on it six months from then when you do it. So that's always the big thing. Uh, be mindful if it's our first trip at these stores. That is the time that A, the customers are most receptive to make repairs. Um, and B, it, it just makes us look much better than, hey, we've been at this store four times already and now you're telling me that we need this repair. Why didn't you catch it? you know, the last three PMs. Right, we're gonna go through a lot of this stuff here, so. <laughs> I also do wanna mention quickly that like, 
in terms of the role that you play as a commercial maintenance technician, um, techs and residential are used to having to have a lot of money conversations with clients. And it's like one of the least pleasant things you have to do. Um, the version of this that a commercial technician has is not necessarily having money conversations with the client, but it's being cognizant of what's in the contract and where some of these opportunities are for us to do more work that's a value to the client. People hire us because they want us to keep their air conditioners in good working order. If we think we're just going to work a checklist and move on to the next job, we're not going to provide that maximum value to the client. But that's where uh, that's where uh, you know a conversation with Jeff or Mike to say, hey, you know, this is maybe our our, our fifth time at this store, and I'm noticing all this stuff. How do we handle this? What's the appropriate way to deal with this? Because we don't want to take a bath on it monetarily if it's additional work we need to do, but we also need to put on our political hats and make sure that we're not going to, you know, throw a bunch of stuff at the client where they're going to be like, why is all of a sudden this now becoming an issue? But that's not an excuse not to address it because that's often what happens. Guys are like, well, look, we've been here so many times, so I'm just going to take this can down the road. That's the worst possible thing we could do at that time. Right. And, and as that tech, you are going to get the dirt on the building, whereas Jeff and I are dealing with corporate. Um, guys who don't work in the building, you're dealing one-on-one -on -one with the manager, the store manager. So any complaints they have, um, they're going to express to you. Bear in mind, a lot of these locations, we do have site maps for. So if the tech is new, they can actually go in to the site and take a look at the site map, and that's gonna tell you the location of all the air handlers. Or should it. They yes. Sometimes they might miss something. Now you've gone around and checked all the connectors and made sure yeah, they're all running and diagnosed any easy problems. It's probably the best time to, to start cleaning them. Um, if you want to get the, the best readings out of the unit, um, you want to make sure that everything is clean and ready to go. Um, inside, hopefully the filters are changed by the time you start doing the the, the checks too. So. We'll get to changing the filters part in a, in a bit. So just right. concentrate on cleaning the condenser. So yeah, we want to try to avoid chemicals. Yeah, so just try to use water go inside to out, take the top off, get into that coil really good and just uh, spray, them, spray them out really good. Get the debris out of the bottom of the condenser. If you try to do it from outside to in, you're gonna be pushing a lot of dirt inside of the coil there. Um, so it's gonna, it could potentially cause even more problems. But, uh, yeah, and while you're doing that, you'll see like the fan wires or the compressor wires. The, some, the sometimes will be laying on top of the, like the suction line or the discharge line of the compressor. You don't want that to happen. So like when you're putting it back together or, you know, if you notice like, like wires with little pits in them that have been rubbing on them, you want to make sure that you get that insulated away from. The, right. So the the, those zip ties that are currently holding the, uh, the high voltage wires together, uh, as well as some low, low voltage wires will break. And the majority of the units you're going to see have wire resting against copper and that is beginning to rub out um and and you know it takes two seconds to get a zip tie and you know make sure we strap those back up both high and low voltage right the idea with zip ties is that we're there every six months so again you can cut the previous zip tie off and put a new one on uh we just want to make sure it's protected that, that we're protecting against rub outs yeah, one of the crappy parts about a lot of these places is there's no water access or there's a hose a hose bib that's like a mile away so you got to come up you got to get pretty inventive with the uh, ways to wash them okay so we've got the condenser coils clean now um, now we want to go ahead with the electrical portion of the condensers um, again uh, you know back in the day we used to individually check each capacitor and then we would quote anything that was more than 25% low. Uh, but when we would quote it, we would word it as capacitor 25% low. And none of those quotes ever got approved. So check your wire connections. Uh, like I said, make sure the low voltage, you know, a lot of times you can't tell, but that wire is broken underneath the nut. So we want to make sure that the connections are, are good and tight. And, if you see any aftermarket crimp connections, most people suck at making crimps um, properly. So if you see aftermarket crimp connections, just check them. You know, look, you power off, make sure that they don't just pop off on you. Um, for those of you who don't have ratcheting crimpers, that's the way to go. The ones that make the indent in your insulated terminal, those actually aren't the right ones. And I use them for a long time that way until I got the ratcheting ones and you realize how much better they are. Um, 
there's yeah. another section on the indent form that you're supposed, supposed to be yeah. using. Yeah. Correct. 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 So anyway, we've, we've checked the contactor, we've checked our connections, we've checked our amp draws. Uh, the in some cases, is dry. We've checked capacitors. Uh, Jeff, you wanna go with pressures and readings yeah. and when to hook up your gauges? And right. So on the first time around on a PM, we always wanna hook up the gauges or your probes, preferably, and you know, and, uh, get the superheat sub cool, everything you can on the unit. Uh, and dial, and let me jump sure in here. Done. When you get it, you need to mark it. You need to fill out uh, our website and enter all your readings because these yes. are very important for future visits. Right. So this is when you want to dial them in perfect. You want to quote every every ounce of refrigerant you can. So you want to be sure that you you have everything correct. Um, the other time I want is um, when the, whenever the impre uh, whenever the apprentices are um, apprenticing. You know, <laughs> apprenticing. Yeah. So um, I want them looking at the patterns. Um, you know, cooking up, seeing how they how they're supposed to run. Um, right. So we want to know how a correctly dialed in system is running. We we want to know the operating pressures, and most importantly, we want to know the temperatures. So right. Go ahead. Yeah, the more experienced guys can just take the line temperatures, and um, know, as long as they know the indoor and outdoor temperatures, you can get enough information from that, and then you don't have to be so invasive on the on the refrigerant side. So. Yeah, and I'll mention quickly, like if you don't know about non-invasive testing, this is not some sort of hack way of doing things. This is a higher level of troubleshooting skill to be able to literally take a suction line temperature and a liquid line temperature and extrapolate its operation based on a baseline. In order to do it properly, though, you do have to have a baseline, meaning you have to have some prior readings to compare to. Right. Um, but even if you don't, you can still get a pretty good idea. And it's because basically what you're doing is you're taking your condensing temperature over ambient and your subcooling and you're pre-doing the math and saying, this is what my liquid line temperature should be. <laughs> That's called approach. Same thing with suction line temperature. You're taking what you know your design, your DTD, your design temperature difference, which is generally 35 degrees, less than your indoor temperature. And then you're adding your superheat back to that. And so that equals 25 degrees. So your suction line temperature is usually about 25 degrees below your indoor temperature. So that's simple. Um, right. Again, that's at the evaporator coil though. Um, so that's right. your inside suction line. So you have to be you know, aware enough to say, all right, how long is this suction line? How poorly insulated is it? If I got a hundred foot of line and it's really poorly insulated, you're gonna pick up a significant amount of superheat down that suction line. But these things aren't like super impossible concepts. They're pretty basic, but you've gotta be aware enough to know how and where they apply. So if you do gauge up, after you put your correct readings in, uh, make sure you put the valve covers back on. Uh, again, something that I've had stores call me before and say, there's these covers laying next to the unit. Uh, quite embarrassing. Uh, obviously don't do that. Uh, again, check for insulation. You know, what kind of shape is the insulation in? Uh, putting your electrical panels back on. Uh, Putting the condenser top back on, all the screws need to go back in. Uh, you know, we don't want to go there and you've got three screws where there should be 12. Uh, those screws, as everybody know, know strip out real easy. Uh, we don't want to just put screws back in that aren't, that haven't, you know, bitten or haven't a grip to it. So if it means putting a self tapper in, be mindful where your coil is, be mindful of the size self tapper you're going to put in so you don't pop a coil. Um, but go ahead and put a new, put a new screw in there and do, uh, to make that tight. So we've done the condenser. We finished up the condenser now. We've, we've put the top back on. Where right. to next? So now we'll go back in time and go back inside to when the guys split up. And uh, yep, so first, the first round, we're going to change the filter and get the split. What do we do to the filter? There you go. Thank hey. you, Larry. Oh, I didn't put that on there. I forgot. Data Fire. and and tag it Kalos, so they know Kalos has changed the filters. Okay, so we're back in at the air handler. Yep. So now, when you take off the panels and uh, do a visual inspection, uh, it's always good to check that blower wheel, make sure it's not caked full of dust. Um, looking at the wiring and the electrical connections, uh, a lot of times you'll see just a rat nest of low voltage wires up in there. You don't know what's going where. Just try to organize it a little bit, maybe, you know, just give an idea of what you're looking at. Um, you know, look at the insulation. 
on the panels too. You know, a lot of times the, the insulation is just pulling off and it's just gonna get pulled right into that blower. Um, and then, you know, look at the drain pan and prepare, you know, come up with some ideas of how you're gonna clean that thing out. A lot of these places we've been there so often that there shouldn't be very much gook in there at all, but it's often not the case. So um, yeah, these units are like horizontal, you know, most of the time they're hanging in horizontal and you can't take the the bottom panel off because the drain line's hooked up there. So best way we found to do it is taking like a, you know, a battery powered vacuum, making a little PVC connector with like a three eighths uh, copper coming out of there and just kind of shove it up in there and get all the gook out the bottom. But there's a lot of ways to, to clean them out instead of just saying, oh, I can't get the panel off, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> right, and the drain pans need, yes, to just point, we've done them so that the majority of them are clean, but whatever is in a pan is eventually gonna find its way into the drain line. So we, under no circumstances, wanna leave any debris inside the drain pan. When are you, when are you taking your split? Oh, we already took the split okay. before we opened the panels. Okay. That was best place, best time to take it is after it's been running for a minute, you know, and then just, uh, the way I normally do is I take the split and then I check the float switch and then I open the panels. Okay. So, so now we get to the, switch. now we get to the fun part of the PM. Uh, this is the, Oh no, we still got to sanitize the evaporator. Yep. So <clears throat> sanitizing the evaporator coil is part of most of the contracts. Um, it's pretty much pretty easy, you know, uh, but make sure it's uh, watered down and not just, um, you know, straight concentrate. Now we'll get to drains, drains, drains. Yeah. Um, this is obviously the biggest issue we have. There's still far too many leak calls. A lot of stores have common drains. And what the common drain is, for those who don't know, uh, typically they have a two inch drain line and all of the units dump into that uh, drain line. Um, we are responsible for the unit to the common drain. Uh, common drain is ultimately responsibility of a plumber. That said, we've all tried to clean out common drains. Uh, you know, we don't carry the right equipment to do so, but we can generally get it free enough that the units will drain, but then we recommend, you know, a plumber go out and do a correct job. Uh, but that's another type of drain. A lot of units have condensate pumps. Um, that's a whole nother, uh, whole nother level of cleaning because if there is a condensate pump, our PMs include cleaning the condensate pump. Uh, we've all gone to a store and noticed some absolute filth inside of there. Uh, same thing, if they're cleaned every six months, they don't get that bad, it doesn't take too long to do, uh, but they've gotta be done each time. Uh, there should be no level of gook in there or slime or anything, uh, especially when you need a float switch. Uh, that's usually if they fail, where, where they fail at. So we have to clean the common, or we have to clean the condensate pump. Uh, help me out, Jeff. What other drains are we missing here? So going back to the, the common drains, um, a lot of times they go to nowhere, to no man's land underground in the sewer, you know, so you don't even know where they're coming out at. Um, or a so, drainage drainage field right. under the building is a common one. Yeah. Now, ultra important, now that Jeff said that though, make sure you know where that common drain is going now. We may not see where it access or, or where it comes out in the building outside of the building, but a lot of those have vents over people's cubes. Yeah. And you hit that with nitrogen and, and uh, you blow a whole bunch of slime over some guy's 1972 uh, Mickey Mantle baseball card. Uh, we have a lot of explaining to do. So whenever we're cleaning our drains, we wanna make sure we know where everything is going. Right. I don't think Mickey Mantle. 72? Yeah, I think. I, no, it was close, late 60s. Yeah. It may be 72. I have no idea, I don't think so. But that's I was four, but I vaguely remember him. So yeah, I've seen a lot of guys using the transfer pumps now, and that seems to work really well. Um, just flowing that, like that high pressure water through the drains. Um, problem is they just do that and then they don't clean out the drain pan. You know who you are, but. <laughs> <laughs> We're not gonna call people out. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so, um, but yeah, so that's really a best, best method for cleaning out the, um, the common drains. Now the direct drains is really easy because you can just put a vacuum on it outside and you're gonna, you're gonna get the drain pan, the drain line, and everything in between. How much water do you flow through it? 
until it's clean. Until it's clean, that's the, yeah. that's the key word. Uh, you're gonna wanna make sure you've got clean water coming out. You're gonna wanna make sure you have a steady stream. Uh, you know, we know the signs of a double trap where, you know, you'll get drip, drip. What are you laughing at? Tinkle, tinkle, tinkle. This, this sounds like turning 40 to me, but anyway, keep going. Uh, and, and then you shut the unit off and all the water comes pouring out, rushing out. So you're gonna wanna make sure uh, we don't have double traps in the drain. And yeah, end of the day, we clean them until they're clean. Yep, until they're clean. Uh, also mention about vents and traps. Like this is something that a lot of people get confused about. Um, and the, when we do the video, we'll put an illustration up here, but you wanna make sure that it is trapped and then vented after the trap and the vent in most cases, especially if the equipment's inside needs to be taller than the inside pan and it needs to be uncapped. So you cap the clean out, you don't cap the vent. The vent remains uncapped. When you're Say that again, it, cap the what? You cap the clean out, the clean out must be capped. The vent must not be capped. The Pretty vents after the trap. The vents after the trap. Clean out, trap, vent. Yeah, and that gets tricky sometimes because sometimes there's cases where they never had, they never had trap and vent, and there might be a reason for it. It might be because they did, couldn't have the fall or whatever, and so you got to really pay attention to the situation because you can't have more than one trap without a vent in between. You always have to have a vent between traps. You're going into a common drain. You should always have a vent. Um, technically, all these types of units we're installing should be should have the trap and vent at the unit. Um, that's really the right way, especially when you're running long horizontal drains. In a lot of these buildings, you are running long horizontal drains. Um, if you have an RTU, you actually don't want the vent to be taller than the drain pan because you would rather, if it did back up, that it comes out of the vent rather than going into the pan on an RTU. So there's some nuance here that you have to pay attention to. It is not complicated though. Right. Um, but to their point, when you're cleaning out, you better be capping those vents during clean out, otherwise the water is gonna come out of the vents rather than going out the drain, and that's a significant challenge. So a lot to think about there. Drains, drains, drains. So uh, drains with condensate pumps, they have that plastic tubing that goes to the common drain. Like the, I just left this extra space storage and that plastic tube ran about 100, 150 feet and there was a clog in that tube. What are your suggestions for clearing that out? Replacing the tube. Yeah. Yeah. With, with yeah. Copper, yeah. With with three eighths copper, most of the time is what is is the correct way to quote that. Again, if if that's what you're seeing, um, you know, we may want to see if we can work that out to get the unit draining so we don't shut them down, and then we'll come back and and I'll quote a long term solution of replacing that with copper, um, but you can keep that poly tube on your truck. And, and if you do find a, if you do find that where you can't get it out, you know, I'll quote a quick fix, which is to replace that existing unit. So that, so the unit's not down and then we'll quote the permanent solution. So it's probably it, kinked. It's probably what, yeah, what's happening. It's very rare that you see those clog. And the reason is because the velocity is so great. It's intermittent velocity. So it's very rare that you're gonna find those tubes clogged, but what you may be finding is that the head on the pump may be too great. But if you're running 100 feet and it's doing all kinds of wiggly, wiggly all over the place, um, and that is a technical term, um, that could be what's causing it more than anything else. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm not a fan of poly tube um, drains anyway. Copper lasts, it doesn't kink as easy, and also copper helps reduce fungal growth anyway. So you're gonna have fewer problems with copper. I know if you have a hanging unit and the drain is a good pitch, try to raise the unit up higher. Right. Uh, to that point, make sure that the, the actual unit is pitched towards the drain. Uh, it doesn't need to be dripped. Right. Right. So if it's installed level, you're fine. Um, certainly, you want to make sure, though, that it's not pitched away from the drain. And also, if you're replacing a unit or you see a unit that re-replaced, and they didn't hang it as high as they possibly could, and you have a pitch issue, we'll then get it higher. And yeah. you know, we want as much pitch as we can get with a minimum of one eighth inch pitch for every foot of run out. And now again, you're not gonna measure that, uh, but you, that's the minimum that you should have. We don't want to drain slack. So, yeah, and always remember to test all the flute switches. Um, when you're doing this, just keep the time delay in mind because a lot of times you'll, you'll, you'll go crap I should have did this first and then you got to sit there for five minutes and be like okay or you got to reprogram the thermostat 
Um, so that's the biggest problem with the float switches for me. And verify also, oh. if there's multiple float switches. Uh, verify that uh, the float switches are not wired in series. They should be wired in series. Or not. Yeah. Right. I, I got my words mixed up. And remember, whenever, whenever you're testing the float switches, don't be careful not to tickle them. Because a lot of times if it triggers too fast, it'll sure. make the compressor turn backwards. And it'll sound like right. a jackhammer. Scare the crap out of you. Or you might be too far away from it and not even hear it. And then it'll just run until it overheats. And yeah. then we quote a new compressor. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, yep. Yeah. So every, every horizontal unit should have, uh, you know, a primary float and a auxiliary pan float. So if it's missing one, go ahead and throw it on the quote. It's probably been quoted 20 times before. Um, but yep, yeah, we'll quote it again until they approve one day when they're feeling saucy. Yeah, every unit needs a float switch and it needs to be working. Another thing with float switches and pans is make sure that they're positioned properly. Yes. Like that's more important. <clears throat> float switches rarely fail. Okay, let's be honest. It's rarely fail, but they are often misapplied. So they're installed improperly, they're wired improperly, or you have a float switch, especially a pan switch, that's not positioned right. It's not tightened down and positioned right. Or you have a pan that's not anchored and can slide all over, or it's not overlapping in all directions. It needs to overlap the unit in all directions. Um, look at the obvious things. It's always the dumb, obvious stuff. Or a pan that's not fastened properly to where as soon as it fills with water, it collapses or slides off the other way. Or like, you got to think about, imagine this pan filling with water and imagine what's going to happen to it when it's full of, you know, 100 pounds of water. Is it going to fill up like it should and then trip the float like it should? Or is something else dumb going to happen? All right. So after you clean the drain, you got to fill the trap. That is, a, it's like the most embarrassing thing to get a call back for. It's like, oh, the float switch is tripped and everything's clean and sparkly and running, draining perfectly, but you just forgot to fill the trap. And yeah, and you're gonna get grief for that. And whenever you're filling the trap, it's a good opportunity to tell how it drains. I like to fill them from inside of the drain pan. So the last thing, after the drain pan's clean and after the drain is clean, you pour it straight in the pan and you could watch it go. You know, you can see if it's pitched wrong, it's gonna go straight to the back, or if it's pitched correctly, it's just gonna go straight to the drain. You can look down the little clean out and see, actually see it drip down the clean out. You're like, okay, and you'll have a lot more confidence in the drain. This is another thing that I just wanna mention, because when you do a store a lot, like if, you, if you've gone to a store three, four times and you know the store, there's places you can save some time. And one of the places you can save some time is if you've already done this, clean the drain pan, you know all this, and you just want to fill traps quickly, you can fill them from the outside. You can fill traps with a garden hose or with whatever you've got from the outside in order to get them filled until they back blow out. What Jeff is saying is like, if you, especially if you don't know a unit and you're not doing, you know, like, that's the way to do it when you're really making sure that everything is, is, uh, is perfect, right. especially if you're not familiar with the site. Yep. And it's good peace of mind just to see how it drains, you know, because then I've always had this kind of weird paranoia about drains because that's like my, like the number one callback for everybody is just like, oh crap, the float switch is tripped. And I was just there, you know, so it's kind of a pain. Okay, so on, on units here, uh, some of the older units, uh, you know, do have capacitors in the, in the air handler. So again, we're gonna wanna check that uh, before you're putting your covers back on. That's, that's the last thing that I would do is I would visually inspect all the wires. Uh, a lot of the same stuff we were looking for at the condenser, your connections for your communication wire, uh, your capacitor. Uh, I always used to like to see how it was wired to the blower motor. I, you know, if it was a variable speed motor, what the settings were, uh, you kind of get a feel for the stores. Some stores are humid and, and you may want to slow them down a little bit. Um, but that just comes with time going to each one of these stores and, and figuring out what applications you have. So we ready to put the panels back on? Yep. Panels. Uh, panels. Insulation, panel insulation. Make yes. sure that that is not coming off. If it's even slightly coming off, right. go ahead so, and address it. Silver tape around the edges. Have a tape squeegee on your vehicle. If you are going to do things like um, taping uh, panels, you want to use a little bit of alcohol. So I, I, would, I want everybody to have a little spray bottle full of rubbing alcohol in your truck. <laughs> uh, so uh, a lot of these units do not have heat strips. Uh, the ones that are 
actually in the storage do not have heat strips. The office units, however, do have heat strips. Um, you're gonna wanna be careful how you test those. Uh, springtime, I don't test them. Uh, I make sure they're not on. You know, I'll, I'll take an amp dry to, to verify that they're not on. Um, but I don't wanna risk setting off a fire alarm or anything. Fall, I wait and see the condition of the inside of that. You kind of got to feel which ones they're going to smell and which ones are going to burn off that dust. Uh, a lot of stores have already been turned on before we get there, so you don't have that issue. Uh, just be mindful of what's going to happen when you turn that heat on for the first time, though. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if the inside of that unit, if we've never been there before and it looks rough, you may want to pull them out and clean those, you know, manually before you put those back on. So heat does need to be checked though in, in the fall PM. Right. Otherwise we're gonna get uh, service calls for my my office is on fire, the air handler's on fire and it's smoking everywhere. Let's so now, uh, well, go ahead. We got the panels back on and it's going back to the drains. We can verify the drainage, you know? So if it's a direct drain, you go outside, you look and it's got the steady stream and it's not starting and stopping, it's not just barely dripping along, and we're good to go. Condensate pump, you see it pump, it doesn't spray water all over the place, you're good. But the common drain, you better clean the good and it better be all right because those will come back to bite and you'll never even know because it's draining in the ether. So now we're doing the final walkthrough and um, you know, reminiscing on all the good times you had the day. So make sure your thermostats are set to whatever they were before you got there. Doing your walkthrough, disconnects. Make 1,000% sure all the disconnects are, are back in. Right. Uh, units that are running need to be on. Units that, that we, we've come out to with a failed compressor, I'm fine with you leaving the disconnect out. In fact, I would prefer that with the cover shut. Um, but you know, that, that's all what we look at in our final walkthrough. You know, we're gonna walk the entire property. We're gonna make sure that every thermostat is set where it's supposed to be set. We're gonna make sure that all the disconnects are in, that there's no trash left anywhere. Uh, we're not leaving tools behind. There's no hoses left anywhere. Carts, and then I'm kind of rambling here all over the place. These are just some of the complaints. Some of the stores have 800 carts and we can do what we want. Some of the stores have two carts. And those things are like gold. Uh, if a customer comes up and wants a cart, we give them the cart. We cannot say we're using it for a PM. Carts, if we use them, they go back where we got them from. Um, be kind to the store manager. The store manager is gonna be your best friend. Uh, yep, yeah, don't divulge too much information and don't right so this is too much information. This is kind of the soft side of the PM. And again, it, it, it changes with the customer. Um, do not go up to the store manager and be like, you got 19 units down. <laughs> like, I don't even know how it's maintaining 85 in here. Uh, because as soon as you leave, they're going to be on the phone with corporate and yeah. corporate's going to be calling me. Why are your staff telling store managers how bad it is? So basically I had my pretty much set story. I would give the store managers when I was done, which is, you know, we're complete, you know, everything's done. I've got a bunch of notes here to go over with your district manager. I'll be giving him a call or I'll be sending him quotes shortly. Um, and then if they say, what is it? I usually just said, it's a number of units. My notes are in the car. I'm not gonna, um, right. but just be smart with the way you handle them uh, and the way you talk to two down store on personnel. The floor, one down on the first. Anything, anything we're missing out here? Yeah, Any, so anybody no. out there know of anything we're missing? Um, I mean, this is, a, this is just kind of like visible air handlers, you know, invisible air handlers, no, visible ones, oh. like, you know, they make invisible ones, <laughs> but, um, I used to, you know, like, put you down, you put all the covers, you know, wipe the unit down. Right. Oh yeah, no, no, so cleaning the actual body, certainly, if, yeah. if these are a mess, nothing, nothing stands out more than a shiny air handler or a condenser for that matter. Uh, if you, it, it, certainly, I, I used to bring some wax and, and I, I wax them sometimes. Uh, that was residential. I mean, again, like, and this goes down to the soft side of this, 
like the managers find ways to to make them your friend literally like find ways to just be, be kind to them i've always said like bring donuts yeah like bring donuts like do you think i'm gonna you think i'm gonna have a problem with that expense absolutely not like yeah if it's for you then be okay but you know <laughs> but but to help the but to help the client relationship to do what it takes to build a relationship with the client um and again like sometimes those things will come up where they're pushing you and just and you can always pull the card out hey look I, this has come up before and so I've really got to be careful with the things that I say. Uh, it's nothing against you. It's just I, I can't I can't get in trouble. Like if my boss has told me, I really got to make sure I give my notes to the district manager first. So that's why that's what I got to do. I'm, I'm really sorry. You know, like you can use that tone with people, and most people understand that. Right. Um, and you can even tell them to call me. There's yeah. always stuff that that, yeah. that 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 that's that's what the hard cases. But in most cases, if you're polite, you're kind, you make things look really good visually. People are gonna again. You don't have to be told to do these things. Um, you can just do them, and they will, it will result uh, in a happy customer and, and in a good reputation for you, and an easy, easier to work for you. It's so much easier to do a job when the client's not jumping down your throat all the time. Um, when they're on your side, it just makes work a lot easier. All right, so PM's done now, and we just have to do all the notes that you took all day long. Everybody on site should take notes all day long um, and just compile them at the end of the day. Um, whoever's the best at organizing words should um, you know put it all together you know just try to keep it basic as possible but detailed as possible you know we don't want to go off on word sprees and we don't want to you know just say unit 14 bad you know <laughs> so yeah so um yep and then just don't leave the job site until all your notes are done um whenever you're out there sitting in the parking lot and you're filling out your notes you're like, crap, I forgot to take a picture of that dang data tag in there. And then you have to go back in there and take the data tag. And it's usually a nightmare, but it's better than being at home saying, crap, I forgot to take a picture of that data tag. And now everybody's mad at you because you didn't get enough information for the quote. You know, so, yeah. So once you get all the notes completed, check out a service channel if needed. Um, and the manager's happy you're happy that you're done and you can move on and everybody's happy that we are now done with this class thanks for watching our video if you enjoyed it and got something out of it if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video subscribe to the channel and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out hvac school is far more than a youtube channel you can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.